At long last, I'm finally covering this part. Not gonna lie, back when I first heard the announcement this was getting an anime, I thought it was a prank given that it had been two years since part 4's anime ended, and all we got in between that time and this announcement was the Rohan OVA series and the live action version of part 4 that will totally get to chapter 2 guys. Yeah, spoilers, we did not get that in 2031. Instead, we just got the part 8 announcement recently for the anime, and discussions of whether or not Araki will even do a part 10, given the numerous delays part 9 had due to his worsening health. But I digress. Now, while I didn't see part 5's anime as it was airing, I was keeping up with bits of it thanks to the Golden Wing Geek Out series done by Spiffy Needle Geeks, as well as through parody series done by Filthy Ramen King and AOE Meme. Seriously, check out those three channels if you can, they're really good. But now that I've gotten the chance to sit down and watch the show fully after all this time, what do I think of it? Well, it's pretty good. Not as good as part 4, but easily in my top 3 parts of JoJo, going off of what I've covered so far on the Mani Presents. Which is a nice way of future-proofing this video in case of what I said about Araki or JoJo doesn't happen in other realities by the time 2031 arrives. It's like a mess. I'm lost. No. Let's get into why I feel this way about part 5. So a couple years after part 4, Koichi goes to Italy to find the secret son of Dio Brando and get a skin sample to send to the Speedwagon Foundation. But after a rough first encounter with the non-half-vampire son, the two eventually work together to defeat a capo's powerful stand, and Koichi sees that Giorno, the secret son, shares a lot of good traits with the Joestars that Koichi had met previously, and sees that Giorno is not a threat to them, nor the world, and leaves him to his goal of becoming a mafia boss to help out the suffering people of Italy and stop the drug trade to kids. Along the way, he is recruited into one of the branches of the Italian Mafia named Passione, led by Bruno Bucciarati, and after killing the capo that had that powerful stand he fought earlier, as well as helping Bruno's gang retrieve said capo's treasure, they then have to protect the boss's daughter from a rogue branch of Passione that want to kidnap the daughter to uncover the boss's identity, and even after most of them are dealt with, Bruno's gang turn traitor after the boss tries to kill Bruno and the daughter, and that leads to Bruno's group dealing with the boss's high-ranking officials, their group losing multiple members along the way due to the boss interference interfering with their plans, the boss's daughter awakening her own stand, and becoming Bruno's ally, and then finally, a rematch slash final fight with the boss himself. Whew, ah, yeah, a lot goes down. But it's exciting stuff that got me on the edge of my seat, and I was excited to see where it went next, to the point where I didn't want to take a break or indoor work on other things because part 5 does such a good job hooking you in and making you want to see where things go next, or how Bruno's group gets out of the situation. Like, how do they deal with an automatic stand that tracks the fastest moving object and can't be killed because the user's already dead and said stand's ability activated after his death? Well, you gotta wait till next week or go to the next episode to find out, and while it is annoying when some shows do this, like I said, part 5 does a good enough job with this concept that it gets a pass for me. That being said, there are some aspects of the story I don't like. Now it doesn't ruin the story for me, but it wasn't enough for me to notice. First off, while most of the deaths in Bucciarati's gang are handled well, Narancha's is a bit insulting. Instead of dying but leaving behind the truth with the boss's face like with Bakio's death, or going out in a blaze of glory like Bucciarati's death, Narancha is put on broken bars off screen, and he dies after Giorno in Narancha's body finds out that Narancha's soul is gone, with barely any time to mourn or leaving much of an impact with his death. Oh no! Anyway... Okay... Look, I get why he was killed, and it certainly came as a surprise, definitely, but I think this death could have been handled much better, especially for a character that I got to see develop and grow in appreciation for throughout the course of Part 5. He deserved way better than an off-screen kill like this, come on. Like, you don't see this shit happening in something like Ruby, do you? <laughs> oh, right. Another issue I have is that Fugo leaves halfway, and we never see him again outside of a rare mention and or cameo, like after Narancha's death. Like, I get why he was taken out. Araki was supposed to kill him back in the day, but he couldn't do it because he was having depression at the time of writing Part 5, 
so we opted to have him stay behind instead. But in universe, this is still really disappointing to have one of the main characters just up and leave the story halfway. It's a waste and really disappointing. Not helped by the fact that this adaptation already makes several changes to the source material, like giving Fugo an actual backstory, or including him after Naranja's death for a short scene, and many other examples. So they could have changed Fugo's fate here. They could have made his character better or contribute more, or hell, maybe even given us that Purple Haze feedback but slightly tweaked. They had a massive chance to fix this issue that was present in the manga, but they didn't. And as such, here we are, and that sucks. In addition, the ending slash final arc is a massive letdown. The Requiem Arrow feels like a badly executed deus ex machina and it feels barely earned whether it be when Polnareff or Jorno use it on their stands, the problem is resolved really damn fast, and not even Diavolo slash the boss dies properly. He's just stuck in a death loop. Seriously? Oh, and Giorno becomes the Mafia boss, but the means behind him getting up to that position are done off-screen. Oh yeah, clearly that wasn't important. Instead, here's two episodes going over the prologue to Bruno meeting Giorno. Oh, and something something fate, even though that was already established multiple fucking times in part 5, but okay. Yeah, if you couldn't tell, I was massively let down by this. Like with Fugo, I get why it would stand all that way, considering how busted Diabolo's stand was in the series. But just because there's a reason for something, doesn't mean I have to like it, and I don't here. The solution to dealing with an OP stand by having an already existing stand transform via a special item and having its ability be convenient to deal with the situation, which is pretty much what the Requiem Arrow does, gives the stand an ability convenient to escape in the situation, whether it be Silver Chariot, Requiem, Soft, and Bodies just in time so Diablo doesn't get the arrow, or Giorno's ability undoing basically everything King Crimson does, is not a clever way, nor smart way, to deal with the issue of an OP villain. It's just lazy, and that sucks, because Kern Crimson and its host Diabala were absolutely threatening when on screen. And while the latter isn't that interesting in terms of personality or depth, his menace slash presence on screen somewhat makes up for it. So to see all that effort and build-up wasted by having them get defeated by basically plot convenience, it sucks. It really sucks. Oh, and speaking of sucking, anything else I dislike about the story slash characters? Eh, not really. Like I said, it doesn't ruin it for me, just something I noticed when watching part 5. And outside of those blemishes, it's a good story, and the main cast of characters we follow, even Fugo to an extent, are written pretty well. They have interesting and sympathetic backstories, my favorite of which either being a tie between Mista and Abakios. They got great chemistry with each other, see Narancha and Fugo. They got good development for the most part, and also got some really damn good fights throughout this part. It's really hard for me to pick a favorite, although Mista versus Ice Guy was pretty close. Sure, the antagonists slash enemies aren't as fleshed out as Part 4's, but like I said about Diablo, they leave enough of a presence on screen to sort of bounce it out of it. Whether it be their stands, chemistry slash relationship to one another like Tiziano and Squalo, or their design is imposing enough to make you pay attention to them, like the rogue Passione branch Lissandra's leader, Rosado Nero. Even the ones they introduced near the end, like Seko and Chocolata, are memorable slash threatening on screen thanks to their stand, chemistry, or design. Now, sure, it would have been nice to see them go a bit deeper with these antagonists, but it works fine enough for this part. Not as good as Part 4's antagonists, and or stand users, but absolutely a step up from Part 3. And they also got their own themes for this part, which is also a nice touch in this already good part, since previous parts only really gave themes for the main baddie and the main protagonist, and that was it. This part, every anime slash hero character pretty much gets a theme and they all sound really good. Jojo in general always has a great soundtrack, and this is no different. Now outside of that, my only real issue audio-wise is voice-wise, and it's that occasionally in the dub, there will be some hiccups or characters saying the wrong name or thing. Fugo, is something wrong? Fugo, is the something fuck wrong? You say At least in the version I saw, which was the Adult Swim broadcast. Hopefully, that has been fixed in the Blu-rays of the dub. And the sub-version is, of course, real good. Speaking of real good, that art style. Damn, it looks good. Sure, there are some hiccups at points, but for the most part, the art style looks really damn good, and I was glad to see a return, sort of, for Part 6's anime adaptation. Animation and lighting slash coloring are also really good and appealing to the eye, so that is an added bonus. But, yeah, that's really all I can say about Part 5. It's a good part that while it has some noticeable blemishes, it wasn't fatal enough for me to dislike or keep out of my top 3 favorite JoJo parts. So, yeah, I'd recommend you check it out if you enjoy the previous parts. It's pretty damn good. So, that is all I have to say. Thank you all for watching, and take care.